Uh, this morning we're going to continue studying our, uh, the book of Revelation. We're still in chapter 13, but I will advise you to put a marker or finger in Daniel 7. We're going to go through Daniel 7 with a little bit more detail this morning because it helps us to really understand the, the kingship, if you will, of the son of perdition as well as the kingdom of the son of perdition. So both of those things are talked about in Daniel 7. So having said all that, I'll invite you to follow along to Revelation 13. And while you're getting all situated, let's open in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, I'm grateful again for the opportunity of fellowship with the saints. I'm thankful for the sharing of your holy word. I'm thankful for the edification of one another. Thank you, Lord, for providing such a bounty that we could receive together this morning. Uh, so wonderful to, to share this time together. I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit that allows us to spiritually discern your holy word and understand what's going on in this future time frame. While we are studying this and, and bringing to life the things that are going to take place on the earth while we are in heaven, I pray as always that it is a great motivator, motivator for us to share the gospel while it is called today. While we are still in this gospel of the grace of God, help us to be bold to share it and live it now. Because I know we all have friends, family, and even those we might just meet one time that we never would want to go through one second of this period of wrath. So may you embolden us, strengthen us in the inner man, give us wisdom as you will, and let it all be done for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. The last couple of weeks we've been looking at the first three verses of Revelation 13, so I thought to read those again and continue what we've been talking about. So Revelation 13, 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. As a reminder for things that we are seeing, looking at in the book of Revelation, since Revelation chapter 11, John was on the earth and witnessing some of these things. In Revelation 12, he sees the wonder in heaven of the woman, which symbolically, again, symbolically it is a sign, it is a wonder, is Israel. And the great red dragon, or the fiery red dragon, the great fiery dragon, that's what the term red literally means in the Greek, puros, pyro, I mean, that's what it looks like. Uh, so that's Satan, which is defined for us in Revelation 12, 9. So we see this clash between Satan and Israel. Okay? So he sees all of that in the heaven, and then he's saying, I stood upon the sand of the sea in Revelation 13 and sees the beast rise up out of the sea. And this beast is described with features of known earthly beasts okay, put together. And these same beasts are mentioned in Daniel 7. That's where we last, uh, left off last time. Last week, though, I had to go first to 2 Thessalonians 2. And hopefully that helped clear up some things in 2 Thessalonians 2. I wasn't planning on spending a lot of time here, but just discussing again that the church in Thessalonica feared they missed the elevator, whatever you want to call it, uh, what if we had a funny name for it the other one, some of these weeks? I don't remember what it is. But uh, we're caught away, raptured away out of here first. Because he says in 2 Thessalonians 2.1, We beseech you, brethren, concerning or on behalf of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and are gathering together up to him, upon him. Okay, that's what he's talking about. That's the context. And he says, don't be troubled, as if the day of Christ has already stood in. Hey, that's the literal interpretation of what it says in the King James is at hand. The Greek term is enhistemi, and it's in the perfect tense, meaning it's already done. Okay, that's what the perfect tense means. 
Okay, so they were fearing that they missed it, they're in the period of wrath, they're in a bad spot, right? But he's saying, no, don't be deceived by all that nonsense as if someone wrote you a letter by me. And then in verse 3, he says that for that day shall not come except there comes the apostasy first. So we talked about what the term apostasy means and how it's only used here and in Acts 21, or, uh, yes, 21, 21, something like that. I probably wrote the verse down. Yes, 21, 21. And it's, in that verse, it it's, uh, says that Paul was teaching to forsake Moses. Okay, so Paul had come back to Jerusalem, meets James, and James is saying, you know, it's heard of you everywhere. You're teaching, these gen you're teaching the Gentiles to forsake Moses, to apostasy Moses. Depart from, desert it, put it away. That's what the term means, okay? And so here in 2 Thessalonians 2, he says, Let, except there come that departure first, and that men of, men of, man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And he goes on to say and describe this beast here in Revelation 13. Okay? So unless the catching away happens first and that guy shows his ugly face, then you're not in the wrath period. Okay? You're not there yet. And that was the argument in, in both epistles of Thessalonica. They both needed that reminder. One church, two epistles. Needed the reminder of that blessed hope that we have. First Thessalonians, every chapter ends with our going to him. Every chapter, okay? So that's the, the, the main context of those epistles, and I'd, I'd love to teach on all the Bible. But those are fun passages to go on uh, because it speaks of our blessed hope that we have. We're avoiding this wrath to come. First Thessalonians 5, I don't think, could be any clearer. We are not appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation from the wrath. That's the context. <sighs> I had a lot of coffee, so I got some energy this morning. Uh, so we don't have to go through any second of this wrathful period. We are saved from before we ever get to Revelation 1.1, <laughs> if, if you will. So all of that is going on. John now sees, that's what we went to last time, sorry. Okay, and then we talked about the son of perdition being revealed, the wicked one, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, who's coming and working is, is after Satan uh, and, and all that stuff. He's, he's going to deceive the world. Uh, that they might be saved for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So I'm, I'm kind of skipping over that quickly, but in Revelation 13, this is that guy. Okay, this is the king of that time frame. And what we're going to look at in Daniel chapter 7 is these ten horns, right, because there's that question of why this consistency of a dragon-like beast in Revelation 12 for Satan, Revelation 13 for the unholy son of Satan, the son of perdition, uh, and in Revelation chapter 17, that other great beast. Hey, what is the purpose of these seven heads, the ten horns? Well, I'm trying to express that as we go through with the different prophets, the words given to them. So this morning I gave you the spoiler up front, but hopefully you'll agree with me when we go through, or, or not, I mean, give me what's true according to Scripture. But when we look at it, the angel that tells Daniel about his vision, it says these are kings, Okay, they're individual kings, but then he also says uh, part of like that that ten kingdom confederacy that I've been trying to express for 92 weeks or whatever Mark told me this morning. So however long it's been, uh, just understanding that uh, that tribulation period, there's going to be this confederacy of ten kingdoms, however it's situated, and what we'll see here is this guy rising up out of the sea is going to take three of those away and for himself or however it's going to be. Uh, couple that along with the Olivet Discourse when Jesus talks about wars and rumors of wars and Daniel 11 when the king of the north goes against the king of the south. It's this constant back and forth. There's all sorts of fighting. Revelation 6 with the rider and the red horse when he takes peace from the earth and people are just fighting, fighting, fighting. Okay, it's a terrible time to be alive. I, I can't sugarcoat that really at all. So hopefully that kind of catches us up with what we talked about uh, the last week or two, which you know me, I kind of muddy that all in my head. I constantly think about this. So I don't remember what I've said out loud and only what I've thought in my head, which is why I ask, are there any comments or thoughts? Or is all this at least somewhat making sense so far? Okay. Well then, um, 
if you would turn with me to Daniel 7, we'll go a little bit more in depth. Uh, last time I just hit highlights showing that the beasts in Daniel's vision here are the same beasts in Revelation 13 verses 1 and, well, 1, 2, and 3, because it all talks about the same beast. So as you're finding your way to Daniel 7, I'll just read again Revelation 13, 2, where he says, The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, that's dunamis, that's the ability power, and his seat and great authority, and that's the Greek term exousia, or authoritative power. It's rendered authority here. So with that in mind, it says leopard, bear, lion, but here in Daniel 7, we're going to see the reverse order. Is there something there with that? I don't know. I just see the same beasts. So if you, if you really see something there, let me know. Uh, Revelation 7, sorry. Oh, yeah, perspective. So looking from, it, from the future vantage point backward or from Daniel from that point forward. Uh, okay, Daniel 7, it says in verse 1, the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of ma the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And again, upon the sea. So remember, he sees the beast rise up out of the sea in Revelation 13. Verse 3 here says, four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they, the ribs, said thus unto it, the bear, arise, devour much flesh. That's that kind of weird thing we talked about eons ago. Uh, verse 6 says, After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it, given to that particular beast, even though it had four, four wings, four heads. Okay. Verse 7 says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a terrible beast. Uh, well, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. 
So I read a lot. Let's pause there and recap for our own benefit. <laughs> These great beasts, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the exceeding dreadful awful one in verse 7, are four kings which shall arise. These are future individuals. Okay, that's what that is saying right there. So when we try to identify, I know I've been guilty of this though too, when you look at that lion, some will say that's uh, Media Persia because Babylon is already established. Well, okay, but here in verse 17 it says it's a king. So Cyrus the Great, right? we're looking for an actual individual. God doesn't name them. I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to identify exactly who it is. It doesn't really matter. Suffice to say that these kings all had the same concept of this I want to rule the world thing. Okay? Because all these kings, at least in my mind, because I'm trying to wrestle with Revelation 17, which the seven heads are seven kings, individuals, and those it, are all these same kind of guys that want to take over the world so that Satan can indwell that guy. Right? He's been trying, arguably, since Genesis 3. Okay, to do all of this, to usurp God and his throne, and specifically who we just read about in uh, verse 13 here in Daniel 7, the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. He's talking there, Revelation 19, right? Jesus Christ returns with the armies from heaven, the clouds of heaven, that's what that is, not the white fluffy things, but actual multitudes. He's going to come back to the earth and establish that everlasting dominion. Now, it's an interesting chapter here. Well, okay, this is my nerdiness, so bear with me for a moment. But this is one of the parts of Scripture that is in Aramaic. Okay, so it's different than the standard Hebrew text, but they're, very, they're similar. I'll just put it that way. Kingdom here is Malku. Uh, king here is Melech, which is very similar to the Hebrew term, uh, which we read about the king of Tyrus. In Isaiah 14, remember these, the satanic, I will, I will, I will. So he's talking about that there too, unless that was Ezekiel 28. But the same term uh, for king is used there. So anyway, with all of that said, uh, this is future tense, future kings that shall arise. Four more are coming here. And the fourth one, so now I'm already teaching myself by saying this, the fourth one here given is that capital A Antichrist, the son of perdition, which makes me think now... You're just getting this brand new off the cuff, by the way, that the seven kings in Revelation 17 have to start, right, number five would have been Babylon, and uh, the one other must have been before that. So perhaps e Egypt is one of those kings mentioned in Revelation 17. If it doesn't make any sense, don't worry about it. I'll talk more about it when we get to Revelation 17. Okay, But it talks about individual kings there. And I know I've brought up the beast with the seven heads. To me, those are seven kings consistent with that same I'm going to rule the world attitude. Satan's choice of that generation, but God has been letting or restraining so far. At some point, though, the restraints are gone and this last beast is going to come to be. All this makes sense so far? Go ahead. Really cancel this question almost. Okay. <laughs> Godfather, of course, has said in verses ah. 1 and 15, he's not referring to his concern about the set like that. Verses 1 and 17. Say that one more time. Uh, he's not concerned about visions of his head. Verses 1 and 15. Not concerned about. Oh, are you, oh you're talking literal. <laughs> okay. Right? Right. Okay, got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, not visions of his actual head. That is a, a, a punny, I guess I could say, because one of his heads, as it were, were wounded to death. Revelation 13.3. Uh, visions of his head here. Uh, okay. <laughs> I get it. That's good. Just, no, I, how he phrased it, I just think it was head. Yeah, if you take that literally, that is kind of comical. <clears throat> um, interesting. <laughs> So these great beasts, <laughs> uh, the, the great beasts, Babylon has already been established. In, uh, yeah, that's one king. So these, the, the lion, the bear, the leopard, those are future kings. And then this last one comes. But there's more to be read in Daniel 7. Verse 18, he says, But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. 
So that's the end result of this everlasting dominion which the Son of God, the Son of Man here, will establish. They will, they will possess this kingdom forever and ever. It will be there forever. Just let it say what it says. Verse 19, Daniel says, I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. Excuse me, I remember last time I brought up, this is absolute, totalitarian, tyrannical power. Okay? He's it just, as it is written, you can imagine the horrible, forceful uh, worship of himself that he's exerting upon the world, the whole world. Uh, and so he's this fierce thing to try and contend with. Some will try and utterly fail. And Daniel wants to know the truth of this, verse 20, and of the ten horns which were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So even with that, here's this king coming to power that's got more oomph, right, than the rest of them out there. Verse 21 says, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. In my margin, I have Revelation 13, 7. Because that's exactly what he writes, what John is writing there, what God says in Revelation 13. Verse 22 in Daniel 7 says, Until the Ancient of Days came, okay, so this horn is going to make war with the saints, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So we get the time frame here again. This horn is going to rule, dominate the world. True Israel will be scattered here, there, and everywhere. And this horn, the son of perdition, is going to overcome the saints, because it's a terrible, horrible time, until the Ancient of Days comes back and establishes the kingdom and gives the kingdom to the saints. Okay? So he's going to overcome them. There will be that remnant that we have read about, supernaturally protected Israel during the tribulation period, but there will be many, many martyrs. I can't escape that fact that God talks about. Verse 23, he says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. And remember, this beast, he was already said in verse 17, is also a king. And this is the point I tried to make at the beginning, the spoiler at the beginning, that this beast represents the king, the individual, and his kingdom. So there will be this confederacy of ten kingdoms which this one horn is going to have authority over. He's given this authority from the dragon. The Satan is going to empower him to have authority over the whole world. And those ten kings will be confederate with him for an hour, as it says in Revelation, but he's going to remove three of them. So we can imagine they try to do something against him. I don't know. We can, make, we can speculate forever. But he takes their kingships away, is the punchline. But here it says, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So again, authoritarian, totalitarian, if that's the right term, tyrannical authority. Ruling by fear, not love. That's a big contrast between Satan and God. Okay, God rules by love, and Satan rules by fear. Verse 25, it says, and he. So here again, we're back to the king, the individual, the son of perdition, that little horn. He shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and then you note this, and to think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, one, and times, that's two, and the dividing of time, three and a half years. So for that latter three and a half year period, he's going to take in under his own authority and try to change times and laws. We can only imagine the manipulation he's going to do to God's holy law, which was agreed to at the beginning of the seven year tribulation period, and how he's going to manipulate it to show that he is God so that they worship him as God when he sits in the throne of God. Right? Well, this is coupling together 2 Thessalonians 2, this pretty much whole chapter here, Revelation 13. 
So if I'm out of line, again, stop me anytime, or if you have any thoughts, questions, go ahead. Because this is deep so stuff, yeah. Perhaps we had Okay. <laughs> saints, I don't often read saints in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And is there a difference between this reference of saints and the New Testament references? That is a very good question. And I'll just repeat it for the sake of the recording. The term saints here, hopefully I get this right, is it different here reading it in the Old Testament compared to when we read it in the New Testament? It, doesn't it just mean chosen ones? Yeah, my first answer is to say they are set apart ones, so in that they are similar, and the just shall live by faith, so in that they are also similar. Here he's talking about the saints, these are the set apart ones, the chosen, God's elect, which I would argue is Israel, under this context here. And are they... They're... I've got a lot going on in my head. I want to say these are the ones that have sincere faith. So in that, there is no difference. They are the set-apart holy ones, but again, all Israel is in scope here, and it's God's chosen nation. So I'm, I'm a little bit wrestling with the answer to that question in my own head. But these saints, they're the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom, so with that in mind, these are the ones with sincere faith. So then there wouldn't be a difference. Right, because the ones under today in the body of Christ, we are there by faith alone. Right? And we're set apart because of God's righteousness he gives us in that moment of faith. But that is a really excellent question. It makes you think about that. And then where's, there's a distinct, in verse 25, and this is the uh, little horn, mm -hmm. um, he wears the saints out of When it says, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and a thing to change times and laws, and he'll be able to do this for three and a half years. We, just to help us to rationalize, at least again, this is my mind, my opinion, I suppose, but we don't like it when those in authority change laws here or give out mandates here, right? And you can imagine, because right at this midpoint of the tribulation, here comes the mark. Boy, that's going to wear me out if I was living in that time frame. You have to get this or you cannot buy or sell. Or, <clears throat> excuse me, about all the manipulation of whatever prophecies he's getting to try to prove himself as God. These saints are going to have the right mindset and say, no way, you're false. And they're going to be the ones praying, God, thy kingdom come. Deliver us from this evil one. All right, so they're going to understand the difference here, but he's going to be constantly after that and preaching himself as God. So in my mind, that's what is indicated by he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Right? They're going to be grieved to the innermost part of their person about all the things he's doing, all the things he's mandating. And it's going to be three and a half years. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I mean, we, we went through almost, a, it's been about three and a half years, right, since the last thing happened. And uh, round two coming, right? Probably. Anyway, or I don't know what round we're up to by, by now in history. <laughs> but verse 26, he says, But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. And that's really the only, I don't have to go any farther uh, than that. So in the end, you got this latter three and a half year period that we're looking at. This last dreadful beast is a combination of all those guys before. So if you can imagine the fear invoked by guys like Cyrus the Great, Alexander the Great, how many greats do we need? Uh, and Caesar Augustus. Like all these guys, we can even bring it around to world leaders that try to do that same thing in, in, in our era. Okay? And, and with evil intent, obviously, trying to exterminate certain people groups. Like I don't need to name the names, you already know them. But uh, all those things that, uh, all those guys are like combined in this one. 
Okay, he's like this amalgamation, here's a fun word, of all those beasts before him. Uh, and this kingdom shall be great, terrible, it'll cover the entire world, and he's going to declare himself God, and he's going to do all these things, but the saints will ultimately overcome him by the word of God, by their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, and by their testimony, right? That's what Revelation says. And they will inherit the promised kingdom. Christ will establish it and give it to them. And you know, there's all this other stuff, too, about uh, the beast was slain and uh, given to the burning flame in verse 11. That's, that's Jesus coming and casting that son of perdition, the false prophet, into the lake of fire. So all these things we can see coming to be, uh, but I wanted to come back here and just explore that political side of things. Because right now, at the, the first half of Revelation 13, that's the side we're seeing is the political side. So he's ruling by politics, and when we get to the false prophet, he's also ruling by religion. So both of these things combined in this one son of perdition. Nasty combination. I think that's all I had to say. I didn't even look at these, so... If anyone has any comments, let me catch up on any notes that I may have written. Okay, yeah, one more thing over here. Uh, Revelation 13, you can leave Daniel 7 behind. Revelation 13, 2, when it says he, had, uh, he was like a leopard, his feet as the bear, mouth as a lion, the dragon gave him his power and his seat. I just wanted to remind us of what it says in Revelation 2 to the letter in Pergamos, in verse 12, it says to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. <laughs> so he's given this seat. He's given this place of authority. And perhaps that's a summer house. We could argue about that. I'm not so sure. But either way, he's been given this authority. Right? Uh, Revelation 13, 2 agrees with that. Not only does he have this seat, his own throne, he has great authority. And what's going to happen at this midpoint of the tribulation, one of his heads will be wounded as it were to death. Because in my mind, Satan does not have the power of resurrection. He does not have it. God has the power of life. But he's going to appear to have died and appear to resurrect. And thus, the strong delusion and that's verse 3. So now we can move on in Revelation 13. Yay! Verse 4 says, They worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So that's where the worship is really going. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So we can imagine by now he's done some exploits to get that kind of reputation. Verse 5, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power, that's the authoritative exousia power, was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And you see how this lines up perfectly with Daniel 7. Verse 6 here it says, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So he didn't just stop at blaspheming God, but also where God lives, heaven itself, the true tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. Who is that? It's the body of Christ. It's the angels that have not given over to follow Satan. Right? That's the heavenly host at this point. So those that dwell in heaven. And I want to really point out in verse 5 that it was given to him. Remember, we read in Thes Second Thessalonians how uh, he who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. Well, now the restraint is gone. Now it's, okay, go. It's allowed. It's given. And so we see this still, the sovereignty of God giving them over, right? Just like we read in Rev uh, Romans 1, how God gave them over, gave them over, gave them over. He's giving them over to these things that essentially the world is asking for, even though the saints are praying something like, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 
Okay, so God is allowing these things to happen, proving the hearts, the hardened hearts, if you will, of the bulk of the world, and it's given unto them. So now he's opening his mouth in blasphemy against God. You can imagine the lust of the flesh latching onto that and for them to go along with it to the tune of eventually they'll be having a satanic Christmas by the end of this chapter. These are kind of heavy words, I know. <laughs> like a heavy situation to really take in. It's really dark stuff. And this is the heart of man by itself. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who shall know it? Right? Or who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. So we get to, we got some time yet. Revelation 13, 7, it says, It was given unto him, again, it was given unto him, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power, that's the exousia authoritative power again, was given him, son of perdition, over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Remember this one kingdom, that one beast that Daniel saw, devoured the whole world. So it's a one world government, which I know we've heard much talk of over the years, and it's this guy at the head. He's declaring himself God. He is the one that everyone needs to answer to. Verse 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Who's, like, who is the all here? Because there's no period there. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. We've talked about the book of life before. Um, okay, before I get that, just remind me, uh, remind of my note. Revelation 13, 7 here correlates Daniel 7, 21. Same thing, same thing written. But here we're at... It, with this written in here, all that are going to worship him are those that have their names not written in the book of the life of the Lamb. And we've done a bit of a study on the book of life. I wasn't planning on going into that. We might do that again. But the high level is if your name's not there, you're not going into eternal paradise. Okay? And how you get your name blotted out is you reject God and reject his Christ. That's it. It's by faith. Okay? You reject that. And remember how Moses said <laughs> something, I, I should find this verse, but he said something about, and if not, then just blot me out of your book. Right? So Moses was basically at the end of his rope because the nation of Israel was basically rebelling against him. He thought they were all against him and so forth, but you know, God would remind him, it's not you, it's me. And, but he's, he's still, you see that humanness of Moses too. If not, then just blot me out of your book. And there's many verses that talk about the book of life, uh, but uh, I gave the high level. That's a fascinating study, so I encourage you, go ahead and do that. But as we're concerned here, all that dwell upon the earth that are not written in there are going to worship Satan. So, hammer falls. Here's the line drawn. Satan, Christ, no offense. Right? You can't be in the middle anymore. If anyone doesn't make a choice, they're with Satan. Okay, because by default, we've rejected Christ. By default, we are dead in trespasses and sins. We are in Adam. So by default, we're with Satan. But God who loved the world has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. That's Colossians 1. And that happens by faith. It's God's work through Christ that broke that down and allowed us to come over. Isn't the gospel awesome? Right? That's where we should have been, and God redeemed us. He bought us back. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And when you really think about all this and study this, regardless of where we are in Scripture, but to me especially Revelation, because you see, here's the punishment God is going to enact on sinful humans. Specifically, it was designed for Satan and his angels, but those that reject God are with him. They're children of Satan, children of wrath, children of disobedience. So God has to do something about that. I forgot to breathe. Hold on. Be, well, I've got only two minutes left. But what I wanted to end on this morning, uh, verse 8 is a good place to go. If you go back with me to Revelation chapter 2, I just want to remind that uh, those that are studying scriptures, those that know the word of God, they're going to realize that all of these things that we're about to look at are at stake. Revelation 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear to ear, 
what? He that hath an ear, <laughs> let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, that's the audience here, the one, the sincere faith, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. If you look down to verse 11, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Jump down to verse 17. He that hath an ear, seeing the pattern, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in a stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Jump down to verse 24. He says, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, false idols, false doctrine, and that have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give authority, power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Down in chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And there's that big thing that we're talking about. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. When I read that, I'm reminded too about, well, several different verses. And now they're starting to escape my poor, infallible, or, uh, no, fallible memory. Uh, but I will confess his name before my Father. Romans 8, we hear how the Son of God maketh intercession for us. How awesome is it that whenever Satan tries to accuse us, because as we read in Revelation, he accused the brethren day and night, he never stops. But what goes on in the heavenly places, Jesus himself says, no, he is mine, she is mine. And you know that that's about you if you have sincerely trusted that Jesus' blood paid for your sins on the cross. And this is so encouraging, edifying, invigorating to hear I will confess his name before my Father. If God be for us, who shall be against us? Like, to me, those things go hand in hand. It's the same, the just shall live by faith. That concept, I know it's a different audience in Revelation, I realize that, but it's the same concept. God doesn't want anyone unsaved. He wants all to be saved and to confess their name before the Father. And how awesome is that, though, really? Uh, look at verse 12. It says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. It's like that stamp of approval. This is where you're going, and no one's going to take it from you. Just love thinking about the absolute authority of God there. Uh, where does I leave off? Which cometh down out of heaven from my God, I will write upon him my new name. That happens, Revelation 21. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And then finally, down in verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All of that is at stake at the midpoint of the tribulation. Rubber hits the road, hammer falls, whatever idiom, is that the right term, analogy, whatever that you want to use, that's it. Because at the midpoint of the tribulation, this is like wrath above wrath upon wrath. Okay? It was bad before it goes to that nth degree. That's the best term I know. Uh, but that's what's about to happen. We're still filling in gaps here of understanding in Revelation 13, 14, and 15. But once we get to 16, it's like bam, bam, bam. All this wrath destroying basically the entire world. And then Christ comes back to restore it. <laughs> I guess this was a good morning for me to drink adult coffee here. <laughs> Any parting thoughts or comments? Yeah. Uh, in uh, Revelation 13 and 8, it talks about the worship, worshiping, say, worshiping the, the one world government, the head of the one world government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that a religious? worship or is it just the fact that you don't go, you go along with it? It's both religious and political. 
uh, you do make a good point there. They're going to be worshiping the one world government and the governor. <laughs> and it gets uh, really crazy. And this is a jump ahead again in Revelation 17. The whore sitteth upon that red beast there in Revelation 17. And these ten confederate kings are going to hate that whore. And that whore represents all the abominations, the idolatry of the world. Every single established religion is going to be hated because that guy is, wants only him worshipped, if that makes sense. So he's going to outlaw everything you can imagine that is called a denomination or cult. He's going to outlaw it to the death. So you could, yeah, you could call it a theocracy, this one world government, yeah. Uh, in, in unholy one. And he's doing it, again, to mimic God's true theocracy because Christ will come as the one true king. Did that answer your question? Yeah. You got me all excited. <laughs> but you're right. It is going to be this false theocracy. I better quit or I'm going to keep going. Any other thoughts? I'm so jittery. Okay, let's... Government and Egypt. Mm -hmm. Government and religion. Yeah, like Pharaoh in Egypt, government and religion. It's, it is very similar to Alexander and the Greeks and their gods and Caesar and his, the Romans' gods, Roman gods. Uh, so that's why I brought up those. Uh, and again, when you get to Revelation 17, those heads, those consistent seven heads, to me again, uh, based on the oh, scriptures I shared this morning and more, that those are those one world king, governor, and like theocratic type governments, both king and, and kingdom, that try to take over the world. The one world powers, if you will. Uh, so identifying them, not that important uh, in Revelation 17, other than we know that the seventh is that guy, the beast, the son of perdition, and he is even the eighth because he appears to die and come back to life. So he's saying he's the seventh, he is also the eighth, he's of the seven because he was the seventh, and I know that language is really confusing. But this same guy is both. The first one, the human one, the second one, indwelt by Satan. Seven, eight. One, two, seven, eight. Okay. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that we can rely upon. Thank you for your, your holiness, your majesty, your sovereignty, uh, your power. God, everything about you is just so magnificent and we can hardly express it in our words. I'm erupting in joy knowing of our the grace that you've given us, our position in Jesus Christ upon faith in your shed blood paying for our sins. Thank you for taking us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Thank you, Lord, for taking care of that sin problem once and for all and for taking care of all sin in your own just and perfect way. Uh, as we continue studying this period of wrath, this day of deep darkness, may you continue to bolster us in the inner man, give us the confidence to preach and live the gospel of your grace through Jesus Christ as much as in us is. For your glory, in Christ's name, amen.